Well, good morning, everybody, to this event that is co-hosted between uh, my organisation, the Higher Education Policy Institute. I'm Nick Hillman, the director, uh, and Advance HE. And in a moment, I'll be handing over to Advance HE's CEO, uh, Alison Johns, who is our chair for the morning. Uh, this is the third uh, in a series of three events. The other two were in person in Westminster. We um, did one on money, in, to, to, to cut a long story short. And we did one on globalization and global HE. Uh, and, and, and both of those uh, recordings of both of those are available. And it's actually uh, part of a series that goes back about 20 years that we uh, did originally with Advance HE's predecessor body and now uh, in recent years with Advance HE. Um, and we're very, uh, have a very good record of being interesting events. Um, and this one is on teaching and learning. Has teaching and learning slipped off the radar? Uh, Alison will introduce our three excellent speakers who cover. Um, uh, a, a large swathe of the UK, uh, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as uh, UK wide. Um, and uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before I turn to Alison. Um, this is an on the record event. It is being uh, recorded. So please bear that in mind. There are journalists uh, listening in. Um, secondly, we're very keen to have your questions after the opening remarks from our opening speakers. There will be a, a good slug of time for you to put your questions to the three speakers. So do please uh, keep those coming. Uh, we'll try and get you to ask your own questions by turning your own microphone on. Um, we'll, we'll control that at this end, but otherwise we can put your questions to the speakers. Um, and do upvote other people's questions so that we know which questions are most popular and most important to put uh, to, uh, to the panel. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna turn over to Alison Johns. Thank you for attending. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to what I know is going to be a very uh, interesting uh, session. Alison. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and, and a very warm welcome from me. Um, we've got a great panel of speakers here this morning um, to look at this really important topic. Uh, I thought I might just share very briefly with you um, some of the things that we are picking up about the teaching and learning agenda at Advance HE, given it's really part of the very core of, of who we are. And, and we're picking up very clearly from our members that student expectations are extremely high in terms that teaching and learning will be delivered flexibly, partly because of the pandemic. Um, and it's not a question of what was before or what happened during the pandemic, it's as well as, it's both, as, that no surprises there. And we know from our joint student academic experience survey that we do with HEPI, um, really important survey for the sector, it's interesting to see how the significant factor of teaching quality, quality of feedback, quality of in-person teaching has moved up the scale in terms of either um, uh, issues to uh, give attention to or questions about improving the academic experience. And their figures figuring more significantly than they had in the past, which is really important. As you know, we have our teaching fellowship scheme and so whilst we see the demands from students increasing, we're also seeing the continued investment and support, both at institutional and individual level in the teaching fellowships. Um, we have uh, very close to 170,000 teaching fellows now, with 600 new this month, um, 10,000, nearly 11,000 new fellows this year. And so we're seeing that... Um, that commitment and that practice institutionally to good quality teaching. So it's an interesting time to be thinking about, well, is it falling off the radar, teaching and learning as something important? I, I don't think it is, but I think the expectations and maybe the landscapes change significantly. Um, our new professional standards framework 2023, which was reviewed by and with the sector, um, is a real deep commitment to teaching and learning practice. And of course, the arrival of, I, arrival of artificial intelligence. Um, is an opportunity um, or is it a threat to academic integrity? Um, my colleague Charles Knight says um, it will be as normal and as ubiquitous as electric lights, um, which is probably true. So how we deal with it will be incredibly important. I think that's more than enough from me, but I hope that sort of set the context from, from our intelligence and knowledge at the moment. I'd like to hand over now to our panel of three speakers, just to introduce them briefly. Um, we're delighted to have Professor Paul Bartholomew, Vice Chancellor of Ulster University with us. Um, also, Professor Nicola Dandridge, Professor of Practice in HE Policy, University of Bristol. And of course, I'm sure you will all recall that she was also Chief Executive 
of uh, the OFS before that. And then we have Professor Nadira Karodia, Deputy Vice Chancellor and Vice Principal of Learning and Teaching at Edinburgh Napier University. We're going to take them in the order of Paul, Nicola and Nazira. They're going to speak for about seven to 10 minutes. Um, and, and if you overrun, I'll be dancing around on screen. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, <clears throat> Please feed your questions into the Q&A box um, and we will curate them, up, upvote them, as Nick said, as, as, as you like. And, and then we'll engage, I hope, in a good Q&A debate after the session. So without further ado, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, good morning. So the question posed, shifting priorities, has the teaching and learning agenda slipped off the sector's radar. I think in order to answer that question, I, I think we first of all have to unpick that term teaching and learning. And too often we use the label teaching and learning, or as I normally say, learning and teaching as a single academic activity, which is not research. But in my view, it's not it's not one thing actually, uh, learning and teaching, and indeed, nor is it actually separate from research. Also, I think very often learning and teaching is combined with, conflated even, with what some people might call uh, the student experience. But I think the two sets of things, learning and teaching and student experience, are, are quite different constructs with some overlapping areas. I think that learning and teaching speaks to the totality of art, practice and science of teaching, and that contemporary notions of the student experience perhaps has its roots in a particular construct that some might contend is neoliberal in origin. Um, thinking about the learning and teaching part for, for a moment, and if I did kind of a bit of a, a thought experiment, and I had to write down all of the terms that, that might relate to learning and teaching as a, as a practice domain, I imagine I would list such things as pedagogy, pedagogic research, academic development, curriculum design, inclusive design, assessment design, learning outcomes, constructive alignment, academic quality, technology enhanced learning, the framework for higher education qualifications, and the professional standards framework. Of course, there are many more and many of those overlap, but they're the sorts of things that I think occupy the time of those engaged in leading this sort of work. And I was a, a, a PVC and before then academic staff uh, development lead. And so that they would have been the sorts of things that define my role in universities. So I throw these things out there to make the point that learning and teaching as a scholarly activity is large and complex domain in its own right. And it's perhaps not helpfully bounded by a single label. And you could do the same thing if we started thinking about student experience uh, and, you know, we throw some terms out there, student health and well-being, value for money, inclusion, learning spaces, clubs and societies, student engagement, students as consumers, consumer rights, customer service, students as partners, graduates, attributes, soft skills development, study skills, complaints and appeals, career support, residential experience and, and so on. So far, I don't believe that I'm referring to anything that we might as regard as falling off the radar, because I think all of those things that I've just spoken about are, are with us today. Now, when I was introduced to this panel event, there was a prompting statement that came through to me that said a decade ago, students were to be put at the heart of the system. And that's, of course, a reference to the uh, 2011 white paper of the same name. And I certainly recognise how that paper responded to the Brown Review of 2010, and broadly introduced a deal for students whereby in exchange for the rising fees that we saw in England, uh, that they would be pl placed at the heart of the system. I think I would contend that this led pretty directly to a greater student engagement within the governance frameworks of the university, while perhaps setting new expectations in relation to the experiences that students might expect. And Alison has just spoken about how some of that stuff comes through. And I think that um, broadly, one might note two types of responses to that paper. There was, and, and, and as Alison just said, this student expectation for what some people might contend is more consumer-centric um, practices that, that speak to that value for money. But I think there was also a, a, a university response, perhaps even a counter response to engage students as partners in the design and delivery of their own university experiences. And I certainly feel we continue to live in a higher education environment that's been shaped by that white paper. However, for me, I would contend it's actually the white paper of 2003 the future of higher education that was more influential in shaping learning and teaching for decades to come. And of course, that paper also said a lot about investments in research too, but it was this paper that brought us uh, a requirement to recognise learning and teaching in the reward and recognition schemes at universities. It brought what was then called the UKPSF, uh, Professional Standards Framework, as a basis for professionalisation of teaching in HE. The Higher Education Academy came out of that space. The Centres for Excellence in Learning and Teaching and an expansion of the National Teaching Fellowship Scheme. 
So the impact of those two, two papers still have resonance today, I'd say that is certainly the case. And I think that the increasingly global nature of higher education, including UK higher education, combined with the frozen fee levels of the English sector have exerted positive pressure on the need to invest in the student experience and that, that kind of construct to grow market share, especially as it relates to attracting higher margin international students, which I believe are, are a necessity to make the current system function. But if I think more explicitly about those learning teaching focused parts of university provision, which I contend to have their roots in 2003, I would say that many of those practices are now hard baked into the system and absolutely remain on the radar. Promotion schemes reward excellence in learning and teaching across the sector. Academic staff development continues to be coupled to the professional standards framework, uh, and that becomes central then to the design and delivery of, of, of programmes through the teaching that happens on the programmes that support that. The widespread adoption that we've seen of objective space curriculum models supported by the framework of higher education qualifications and benchmarking statements and all that infrastructure means that the practice of learning and teaching is well professionalized and well supported. So having given that kind of historical context, what do I want to say about um, where we are now in 2023, especially perhaps as it relates to the recent pandemic and the changes in practice that we saw as a coping mechanism for that crisis? I've had many people ask me whether at Ulster University we had changed our operating mode forever and would we be seeking to exploit the potential of technology enhanced learning to change the way in which students learn? And I'd have to say that's been a resounding no for me. I think the pandemic demonstrates as much as anything how the human to human interactions that we, that we see in university are to be valued and how learning is lost when we don't learn together and how learning design is not the same thing as instructional design. I would contend that learning is a deeply social practice and one that benefits from co-location. At Ulster, we've invested heavily in our campuses and we continue to seek to support students in both their interactions with our staff, but also with each other. And what's more, we've placed students' social experiences as, as central to our mission as their learning experiences are, because we believe that that synergy between learning and social activities gives the best outcomes for students. And of course, that reflection's partial. The technology that we used during the pandemic developed our collective practice considerably, and in many ways, we become more inclusive as a result. Um, but we do need to use, so we do need to use the institutional learning to hold on to those inclusivity gains. But I also think we can do that while continuing to embrace learning as a social and co-located experience. So for me, no slipping off the radar for learning and teaching at universities. But whether there's been some slippage for government, that's another matter. I mean, I think it says something. I'm pointing back to 2003 as the policy document that made the most difference. And although in recent years we've had, you know, success in a knowledge economy that came in 2016, that white paper emphasise marketization with students, student choice as a justification for it. Personally, I think the governmental discourse that's cascaded from that has conflated two distinctly different conceptions of demand. Society's demand for skills, absolutely legitimate, but also students' demand for courses that they want to do. So there's two different sorts of demand there. And although there are opportunities for the teaching excellence framework to drive enhancement, especially as it relates to the attainment gaps of minority group, any conception that TEF primarily sits in that market intelligence space as a tool to inform student choice, if we're not careful, I think it has the power to eclipse the good work that we can do and have been doing around enhancement. Sometimes I think learning and teaching as a thing gets juxtaposed with research and, uh, and, and these are put as if they're completely separate activities and I don't believe they are. At Ulster University is a dual intensive institution, research is certainly valued, invested in and championed. And I don't believe there's an either or dichotomy in relation to academics teaching and or research identities. It's important that we value and reward both and accept that each person might have different emphases in their own practice. So in summing up, I'd like to return to that question as to whether learning and teaching is fallen off the radar for universities. Like research, learning and teaching remains a core, even defining activity for universities. The practices and investment patterns that underpin learning and teaching are, I believe, now hard baked in. And I, for one, think higher education is all the better for it. Better for students, better for staff, and indeed, better for society. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Paul. There's some really important distinctions there between you know, learning design, learning instruction, learning technology. Uh, some of those definitions are really, really important to be clear about what we're talking about, but also a very strong case for, you know, we are social animals and learning together is really important to us. Um, how, how we hold on to inclusion, really, really challenging as well at the same time. So thank you for that. I'd now like to turn to Nicola, uh, Nicola Dandridge, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Alison, and thank you very much for um, inviting me to contribute to this uh, discussion. Um, my uh, rather obvious question to this issue as, ha as to whether the teaching and learning agenda has slipped off the radar is um, a bit like Paul, really. I mean, overwhelmingly, no, I don't think it has slipped off the radar. But in some respects, I, I think it has. And it rather uh, depends, I think, on um, whose radar you're talking about and and in which direction uh, the radar is pointing. So what I want to do this morning is just identify um, four or five reasons why I think we can categorically say it hasn't slipped off the radar and then uh, finish by identifying some reasons why perhaps it points to it being a legitimate question to be answering, uh, asking and answering. So firstly, um, learning and teaching being on the radar, um, it is worth bearing in mind that at institutional level, um, there are over, for example, 400 uh, higher education providers registered in England on the OFS register to provide teaching. And only just over 120 or so receive QR funding, uh, research funding. So even though you know, universities will receive other sources of research funding and R&D um, investment, um, the figures do demonstrate that numerically overall, there are many, many uh, providers whose sole or primary business is teaching and not research. So inevitably, uh, learning and teaching has to be on their radar. It's what they do and they don't do anything else and they do it extremely well as a general rule. Um, and, and as an extension of that, even those that do do teaching and research, um, including many research intensives, and as we've heard from um, Paul, um, teaching is, is absolutely central to what they do. And in financial terms, overwhelmingly more income will come from teaching than for research. And indeed, research is a lost leader and relies on teaching income for cross subsidy. So any institution that doesn't take teaching seriously, and um, particularly in our demand-led system, is um, taking some serious financial risks. So again, I think uh, clearly it has to be at the heart of their activity. Um, and um, more recently um, in England, we've just completed the TEF exercise, huge exercise where um, registered providers have had to make submissions to the TEF application process run by the um, office for students. And that will inevitably have put teaching and learning on the radars of those, um, certainly those leading the educational revision, but senior teams as well. Um, and, and when those results get published later this year in September, that focus is going to continue externally as well as internally. Um, the other area which I think is important here is that there is always public and uh, media interest in students and teaching. I mean, not least because just so many people are affected. If you're, if you're not at university yourself or just graduated um, or plan to go, many people will have children or family friend, friends or, or just know people who are at university and, and people will have an interest in teaching as well. Actually, in my experience, they will have an opinion on teaching and learning too. So this is a very live issue affecting the whole of society, which I think, again, I think, um, means that it is on the radar. And then to finish, I mean, rather on this point about why it's on the radar, rather the same as, as what Paul was saying, I mean, learning and teaching is what, teaching is what universities do. Um, some do research, but all do teaching. Um, and there are loads of inspirational, um, hardworking uh, lecturers and support staff who are totally committed to their students. There has and always will be. Um, and and as Alison said, students rightly have high expectations of, of quality, um, and that's endemic and embedded in university activities. So to suggest that teaching is not on um, universities or students' radars at that level is, is, is just not accurate. So I, I think we can confidently say it's on the radar, but the reason that I think this question is important is that I think there are counter issues. And as I said in my opening remarks, I think the, we need to look further at the direction at which the radar is pointed. So um, firstly, I think it, teaching almost um, by its very nature 
uh, is a more invisible practice compared to, say, research. So the Teaching Excellence Framework is an institution-wide exercise that does take account of subject level differences, but doesn't in itself disaggregate any further, even though obviously it allows for that disaggregation at institutional level. But if you contrast the REF, um, each individual academic is assessed and, and, um, and then may or may not be submitted, which means that the profile of the individual academic is very much more visible for research than in teaching. Um, and, and also, I mean, generally, in terms of undergrad, undergraduate teaching, there's a similarity in terms of what happens year on year. I mean, obviously, there are innovations and they're really important, but by definition, research is, is always moving on and exploring new materials and new processes and new approaches. I mean, that's, that's why it's research. And I think that makes it very much harder to maintain um, undergraduate teaching on the radar um, in the same way, the same individualized way as you have with research. And I think my second point, this is reflected in the media interest too, um, exacerbated, I think, by the need for stories, the hook for media interest. So, so a new discovery in research is always of itself newsworthy and, and almost always actually reported positively. But, you know, X uh, undergraduate class receives um, outstanding teaching. Um, or even, you know, the, the class receives new and exciting pedagogical approaches. It's just not going to hit the headlines. So unless, of course, the story is negative about teaching and learning or value for money, in which case it undoubtedly will. So I think there's a visibility issue there, which is exacerbated by media approaches. And then um, a point that Alison well, and Paul touched on. I mean, in terms of students, there's so much else that's happening um, on the public and institutional radar beyond just teaching. I do accept Paul's point that you can't disaggregate them and separate out teaching from the broader student experience. But nonetheless, there are such um, pressing issues of mental health and cost of living and belonging and equality and accommodation pressures and so on and so forth. And those are very practical, very immediate, very urgent. And I think it's and it's impossible not to be concerned about them. So I think the tendency is that they can squeeze out um, public um, a, a focus on foundational issues of teaching and learning unless we're careful. And fourthly, and this goes to the point about the direction at which the radar is pointing. There are such pressures on universities at the moment, financial pressures amongst others, that there is a risk that the attention of senior management regarding teaching and learning can end up tilting towards marketing and finance rather than those concerned with teaching quality. So as the pressures mount, the question becomes, in a demand-led system, how can we market ourselves better to attract more students, particularly international students, or how can we expand the provision of X subject because it's profitable? And again, that sort of can crowd out, if you're not careful, questions about how we can improve the actual teaching that we do. And then um, finally, politically, as um, Paul said, I mean, I think in, it, it's tangible, there's more focus, political focus at the moment and interest in research and research investment about the aspiration to make UK science and technology to superpower and supercomputing and space technology. I mean, all, I should say, really important, but higher education is just not on the government's radar to the same extent. And certainly politically, there seems to be very little appetite to uh, review teaching funding because of the sensitivities. So I think politically, it's simply not on the radar in a way that, for example, research is. So I think it's quite a mixed picture. I wanted to finish, Alison, if I can, just by making by making three very quick points about identifying what we can and should be doing about this. I mean, there's so much here, but I wanted to finish on a bit more constructive note. So firstly, I mean, I think really a shout out to Happy and Advance HE, and in fact, all of you who dialed into this conference, making sure that teaching and learning is consistently on the agenda, being champions of this agenda. We need these sorts of discussions and debates to be continually promoted so that the radar is very firmly pointed towards the importance of teaching and learning. And secondly, I mean, I think there are still inevitably imbalances. When I say inevitably, actually not inevitably, there are still imbalances between the prestige and status um, attached to teaching and research in terms of careers and promotion and job mobility and so on. I mean, it is undoubtedly changing and changing for the better, um, but I think there's still much more that we need to do to, to ensure that 
promotion routes and rewards and recognition and also to to correspondingly raise our game in terms of the expectations of teaching staff so that inspirational education leaders are valued in exact in, in the same to the same extent as that as their research counterparts and then um thirdly and finally very practically and we've got these test submissions going to be published in september and i think they're going to contain a wealth of fantastically inspiring material. And we've got to use that as an opportunity to draw on it, analyze it, collaborate on it, promote it, share it. And I think that could provide an unparalleled platform actually for um, promoting um, teaching and learning and ensuring that it is positioned positively, right slap bang in the middle of everyone's radar. Thank you, Nicola. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Nicola, for that. And, and also giving us three points to focus on on the end. And as you say, the test is going to be a great opportunity, isn't it? So thank you very much, Nicola. Um, uh, Nazira, there you are. Um, so we're going to hand over to Nazira now to kind of, uh, oh, you're the third speaker. I don't quite know what you are going to do, but tell us what you're going to say. Thank you, Nazira. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Alison, for the introduction. Um, yes. As, as you say, Alison, being the third speaker, I think, uh, gives, me, uh, gives me a chance to explore other areas. And I'm trying now to just quickly uh, update uh, what I was going to say by not repeating what uh, the other speakers have said. Um, so let me uh, ask for some degree of uh, patience here with the, with the audience today. So please... Uh, uh, do expect a degree of generalization as well in what I'm going to say. I too believe that learning and teaching at uh, most of our universities, if not all, are robust and continues to be a primary university mission. I believe there's great support and commitment for enhancing teaching and learning and, and the quality, we heard that from uh, the, the other speakers, you know, quality is a, is a core part of uh, our focus as well. And this is integral and is an integral function of higher education. There is so much evidence and such exciting work that I can point to both, you know, on the Advanced HE website or on any university's annual learning and teaching conference. So, you know, there is a lot of evidence for this. I also think that most universities believe in a teaching research nexus, uh, much as uh, we heard from, from Nicola. However, we cannot take that positive moment for granted. Uh, we are on the shifting sands of great social deprivation, austerity, and students only remotely connected to the physical university and the strain of AG finances. These pose challenges that could both, I believe, derail learning and teaching enhancements and perhaps our very universities too. There is a view that what a university does is twofold, offer immersion in the core discipline and educate for citizenship. In other words, the focus on the whole student and the development of the whole student. Uh, we know and, and I think I might be speaking to the converted uh, here today, that these two are not different strands, but complementary aspects of the same education. The view that splits this into two may hold that our wider attention of students' growth and skills development is, extrins is extrinsic to core discipline learning, so it is peripheral, and that's where I believe the danger comes in. So uh, for me, I had to quickly uh, readjust my notes here uh, and uh, I've redefined my two significant challenges uh, for us. So that, that's apart from the ones I've already mentioned. And I'm trying to now think about the focus for this. I would suggest privatization and the related outsourcing of university functions might be two areas for us where there would be significant challenge. In presenting this analysis, I am following a rather extreme view and I'm doing this rather deliberately because I would like us to engage in this debate. So uh, again, do expect a degree of generalization. The point I'm making is that the future of universities may be precarious and learning and teaching at our universities even more so than the university itself. 
So what is it that may work against both universities and our more recent focus on learning and teaching? Let me explore this privatization further. The ideology of privatization, that is services and users are guided by notions of a market economy. So if core learning as traditionally described can be economically acquired and perhaps more efficiently delivered, the push of the market would suggest that as that would suggest that as the preferred route. And in the moment of austerity, which we're now experiencing, it makes existential sense to follow that path. It is expedient. Austerity and market economy are intertwined. So austerity is politically created by market-driven political movements and fiscal cuts in public services, dampening wages and expectations, and a workforce which is desperate for any work creates an atmosphere conducive for lower tax deletes and a greater control of society. I'm not trained in political discourse, but my work at universities and now my current focus of learning and teaching compel me to look at the societal forces that threaten, uh, that threaten learning and teaching. So universities respond to and often mirror the driving forces of society. The austerity and market demands of our time are played out at our institutions. You can visit any picket line of lecturers and university staff striking for better working conditions, and that reality hits you really hard. So in this climate of trying to meet market demands, there is, I think, a drive to focus on the more core material of any discipline, but without the perceived frills of the social engagement, the human elements, you know, the human growth, the personal development, or the intrinsic maturing of the student. Those, however, are the primary functions of learning and teaching. And I believe there's a real threat to now, to what we now record, regard as uh, university essential uh, essentials, and that is essentials for engaging students through learning and teaching towards uh, sustainable development goals, for example, uh, social engagement, equity in the community being some examples. So apart from these uh, uh, meta threats, let me give you two example of how, examples of how I um, see the market intruding into the everyday life of a, of a university or, or perhaps some universities. And that's uh, something that Nicola also uh, uh, discussed. And that's the uh, recruitment policy practice at some universities and also the support uh, for, uh, for, universe, for, for staff who are engaged in learning and teaching. I'm very proud that at my university, we have a, an early career academic framework. And this is a, a framework which supports all staff who are on any of the career pathways they choose, whether it's research or whether it's uh, learning and teaching, there is support for them as they, as they join us. And also the opportunities for promotion and progression are very clear and I think we want this to be more clear and more consistent uh, across the higher education sector. So where we see uh, contracts being given that are short term and uh, lower salaries for staff engaging in learning and teaching, then I think this is an example of where we are pandering to the notion of teaching as a market commodity. The other area for uh, attention is the outsourcing of student support, uh, student welfare, and, and also some aspects of academic support. Now, I am hugely excited by the opportunities of uh, generative AI and the potential that brings uh, for change in uh, 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 assessments, for example, but also for some aspects of, uh, of student support. Now, here is, uh, uh, is something that I am particularly concerned about, and that is the outsourcing of entire aspects of uh, student support 
to an algorithm control system, which is brought in um, uh, to support the student through both personal growth uh, and study aid. And here my concern is around those vulnerable students who may potentially become even more vulnerable and disengage and leave university. So I, I bring this aspect in with that lens on. So as I say, I'm hugely excited by the opportunities uh, that are emerging, but I just wanted to, to highlight that aspect. So I've talked uh, about privatization of learning and support as a reflex of a market economy and the drive perhaps uh, through austerity uh, to move away from um, uh, the more, more personal in-person social support that I, that I believe our, our students deserve and, uh, and need. So I will, um, I will stop there and uh, yeah, happy to uh, take on any further questions because much of what I had to say coincides with what mm. Paul and Nicola had mentioned earlier. Well, Nazira, that's fantastic and fantastic timing too. You're bang on the money in terms of uh, finishing when we needed you to. So thank you for that. So three very, very different takes on this question. One which was much more sort of learning design pedagogy. One, I suppose, the perspective more of a risk-based regulatory approach, some of the tools that are out there, keeping it on the radar. And then finally, wonderful to hear your sort of market analysis, market approach, and, and the what you see as the potential impact that can have on the teaching, learning and agenda. So if I could invite our speakers back in and I'm just checking the questions, they're beginning to come through now, which is absolutely great. Um, so could I start off? We've got Rod Bristow and then Mary Kernick Cook. So Emma, I hope you've been um, keeping an eye on these. Could we invite Rod and then Mary to ask their questions? And, um, and please keep the questions coming in. I know Nick and I might have a couple if, if you're quiet, but you're not usually quiet. So first, Rod, where are you? I'm here. Thanks, Alison. Great. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you, but we can't see you. Um, OK, that's fine. Um, okay. Probably just as well. Um, um, <laughs> uh, look, at, thank you very much to you and all, all of the speakers. for This is a really important conversation and uh, uh, lots to, to be agreed with. My question was... Uh, just around there's a lot of work in fact England has developed quite a reputation in the last 10-20 years for a bottom-up sort of evidence-based uh, sort of research that's being done uh, on what constitutes good teaching good teaching practice you see the Education uh, Endowment Foundation uh, organizations like Research Ed there's huge energy lots of data lots of evidence toolkits being produced these tend to be used and, and there's a lot of then executive leadership in multi-academy trusts and, and, and schools that ensure that this practice is, is, is actually happening in schools using data and all, all kinds of other tools. It's, it's, um, I just wonder whether there are any lessons to be learned from this uh, that could, could, of course, higher education is not the same as school education, but nevertheless, teaching is arguably teaching. Um, I just wonder whether there are any lessons to be learned, you know, even from the approach and some of the research that's been done in schools that could be applicable to higher education. Um, thank you for that. Rod, could you just tell us where you're from? Perhaps all speakers just say where you're from so we, we understand your context as well. Yes, uh, I'm a visiting professor at UCL at the Institute of Education. I am. Um, I'm advising uh, education technology okay. business because I was pr previously the president of Pearson uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, Thank you. Thank board. you. Yeah, so who, who amongst the speakers would like to have a go at this first? Paul? Super. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. And, and, and thanks. Thanks for that question. I think that it's it's kind of multifaceted, Rod. I think the things in terms of absolute translatable lessons about what works in, in education across the higher education or within higher education. I think there is in, in infrastructure in, in relation to that. And I think that infrastructure is broken down into two parts, really. You've got the formal infrastructure that's processed through journals and conferences and so forth. But you've also got a really important um, informal infrastructure that really goes on um, un, un, unsung at universities. And they're the conversations that people have together, professional conversations about what's, what's working for them and their reflections on their 
on their own practice. And I think that we could do more in ensuring that we bolster communities of learning within our universities where that sort of practice is shared. And we have habitual practices of engaging with um, pedagogic literature. But I think it's really important that we don't underestimate the way in which uh, informal stories around effective practice propagates and, and uh, inform what people, what people do. There are things that we can do systematically. And indeed, I, I, I think, um, you know, some of the data that was collected uh, through, through the TEF process, which, which shows the degree to which things are perhaps successful according to certain metrics, and, and, and some metrics are better than others. I'm one that thinks that progression, for example, is a really good bellwether of, of academic health. If, if students are progressing through programmes, that's a, that's, a really that's a really good thing. In my own institution, we initiated a programme called CAKE, the Continuous Assurance of Quality Enhancement. And what we do through there is we go down to right down to the, to the modular level and we look at a bunch of metrics. But it's really important that those metrics and the collection of those metrics aren't, aren't seen as being an end in and of itself because there's always a, always a story behind it. So where we see some outlier metrics, we meet with the program team and, and, and we start off by saying, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And then we say, OK, well, we've got this phenomenon that we're observing here. What do you think went on? And it's really important that that's seen as being co-owned by management and by, by the staff, that we are there to, to support them, to enhance things and make some things better. And to ask that question, what do you what do you need? And to make such suggestions and to resource it appropriately so that together we have a social infrastructure that's there to, to support um, staff. And indeed, we call that supportive, supportive measures. Sometimes we throw money at it, throw, sometimes we throw uh, people at it, but we also always have to kind of uh, recognize that there's always a context and a, and, and a story and 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 not to, to want to get too too held up on on metrics and things the first year that i did that in in, in the institution under nss ulster university went from 90th to 23rd just by trying to concentrate on and understand our own data and put enhancements in place in a way that didn't alienate our staff or make them feel in some way that something had gone wrong but merely sim simply understanding the phenomenon coming up with suggestions. And actually, as a university, I've largely abandoned a target-driven approach. Instead, we work together to think about what are the things that might make things better? Let's do those. And we hold ourselves to account to, did we do those things? May, the needle may move, it may not move. But if we can all be sure that we did more of the right things to make things better, then that's a good result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a, a very fulsome answer. And I think it's it's really, really interesting to think what we can bring in from other learning. Um, we have got some other questions. So I don't know if Nazira or Nicola want to add anything to that. I'll, I'll, Nazira, is there anything you'd like to add about what can we learn from education in schools? I, th I think Paul's answered that quite, uh, quite well. Uh, but the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, especially the supporting of the individual, I think there's a lot we can learn from from schools. Thank you very much. Um, Nicola, is there anything you want to add? I really want you to take the lead, Nicola, on the next question from Mary Kern at Cook. But is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, I think there's more we can do in terms of centralising that focus. Um, but Paul's right, it's happening at disciplinary level. Um, I think it's more complicated in higher education because you've got um, universities devising their own curricula, which it makes it much harder than it is in schools. But I think the point that Rod makes is a really powerful one. Super. So, Thank you. Oh, go on. Um, you, no, I was going to say, do you want me to... Um, no, Mary, I'd like Mary to ask the question. And then also, Emma, if you could be lining Quinton up for his question, um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Can you can you hear me all right, Alison? We can hear you, but we can't see you. But that's maybe how you want it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so my question was, what to what extent um, less linear program delivery? So, for example, micro credentials or um, modular courses under the lifelong loan entitlement. To what extent will these challenge the current paradigm for learning and teaching? And also, what are universities, what are teaching and learning leaders doing to prepare for this? And, and just picking up Paul's excellent point about progression, what, what will progression look like uh, in, a, in a kind of modular delivery world, particularly if a student progresses to a, a module at a different institution and a different course and potentially um, a, a, a different programme altogether? Thank you. 
So Nicola, if you'd like to lead on that, then I'll I'll ask uh, Nazira to comment and then Paul. Um, we've only got 15 minutes less and I've got a couple of other questions. So if we could try and keep our answers relatively brief, that would be helpful. Thank you. Fine. <laughs> Um, and hello, Mary. And that's a heck of a challenging question. Mm -hmm. If I can attempt to answer it um, concisely, uh, I, I think we don't yet quite know what the um, government funded lifelong loan um, entitlement is going to translate into in terms of programme delivery. So there's a bit of a question mark over this, but I think it has the a potential to be um, transformative generally I think in an incredibly good way um, in terms of enabling um, a, a, obviously a larger number of people but people by definition over their lifetime to upskill in a way that we and they need so I think it can be transformative in terms of the um, impact on program delivery. I think we've really, I mean, obviously there are, um, there's quite a lot of modular provision within the sector, but it's quite focused, it's quite small scale. I think if that's to become really a significant element in our higher education provision, then we're going to have to rethink some quite significant issues about how we define quality, how we perform, how we support those students, um, how we keep in touch with them, how we make sure that the individual modules have purchase and currency um and uh, and obviously just uh, we'll have to review how we um define success i think a lot of it's to do with transparency um and if a university says that this is what a course is going to deliver then it's going to have to deliver that and i think there's going to be probably a bit of a tilt towards um contractual um terms because there's a sort of inevitability about that i think um but our leaders doing enough to think about this I think they are thinking about it whether they're doing enough I, I I don't know and probably other people including you Mary will know more about this than I do it's a great question though and a really important agenda um can Alison can I put in a bid to comment on Quentin's question when we get to that as well yeah okay so um thank you very much Nicola um I think what I might do is I've set you up to answer these, but I'm going to pick the questions and just allocate them because they're coming through. We'll never give everybody a chance to answer all the questions. Nazira, if you have some any comments on this particular point, because you must be thinking, well, not in Scotland necessarily, no, but. Well, that's yeah. it. Uh, so my point was around uh, around Scotland. So clearly we would like to see some some changes uh, to what the government's proposing. Of course, uh, it's not life, uh, lifelong or lifetime because um, mm. uh, it stops at 60, I, I believe. And so that's another issue. However, that aside, I think it has it's it's going to be a big disruptor in a positive way for the higher education sector. And uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to to what that brings. So I would uh, I would like to see, though, um, Scottish universities being uh, included in, in in this opportunity. Thank you. Paul, any reflections? Only slightly on. I think that the, the micro credentials thing is a, is a different sort of curriculum design with 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 different aims and probably a, a different outcome to, to the experience. I think it's quite quite distinct from from the overall university experience. That when Nazira was talking about you know a, a space for, for for learners to mature and to find themselves, we're not necessarily talking about that. It's much more CPD focused. I don't think that the curriculum design elements and and, and the quality elements frighten me at all in that regard. I, I think they're easily easily. Uh, put in, but I do think that it's a different different construct that we can run in parallel with more conventional degree programs. Thank, thank you very much. So Emma, we'll go to after Quinton. We'll go to Johnny Rich and then Ali Iden. And um, so Quinton, if you'd like to ask your question, I will give each of the panel members the opportunity to answer this one because I think we'll get three very different perspectives. Quinton, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. It's a bit of a cheeky question. <laughs> um, you know, it, there is a political uh, lens which suggests that we should be judging the quality of teaching on the basis of the salaries of the graduates that we produce. Uh, now, I'm sure we can we can all see the, 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 the pitfalls in that um, rationale, but there is nevertheless, I think, a, a foundation to it. But I'd be interested in the three panellists' views on it uh, and just whether they think there's any, um, any real uh, ability to judge quality of teaching on the basis of the 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 the, the outputs of the the graduates so nicola do you want to start off answering that one as you put a bid in <laughs> um yeah um 
uh, uh, thank you, Quentin. Yeah, a quick response to that. Um, I think and if you if you define quality narrowly, then no salaries has got nothing to do with that. However, if you're looking to, in terms of what's relevant to students, then I think salaries are a factor, um, not by any means the most overwhelming one. Um, graduate jobs is far more significant than actual salaries. And I think if um, the government is um, subsidizing universities then as, and teaching as they are, then I think it's um, a legitimate question for them to be looking at. But in terms of quality of teaching, um, no, uh, a narrow definition of quality has got nothing to do with the salaries. And, and incidentally, I, I don't think <laughs> government would suggest otherwise. Thank you, Nicola. Paul, what are your thoughts on that question as a vice chancellor? <laughs> I think nomenclature becomes really important because you hear such things as, you know, low value degrees. And then you're thinking about, well, what is the value of that degree? And if the low value is has a, has a, has a low fiscal value to the economy, I suppose you could make a, a, a case a case for that. And we would all say, say that, that universities drive the economy. But I don't think it relates through to the quality of teaching or indeed the quality of, of, of learning. But it does, it is an important debate to have what does society value and is the notion of value tied to salary? I don't believe it is, but I do appreciate how, how salary and, and, and the additional salary is used to legitimise the system that we have in terms of fees and the investment that we make and return on investment and so forth. So I think it's a rather circular discourse where we can uh, appreciate that universities create value within the economy but I think that rather than trying to, to dismiss it as a neoliberal concept, I think we probably need to embrace it, but seek by through that embracing to merely extend the notions of value around cultural, social value, as well as economic value. And then I think perhaps we will get a fuller discussion around those alignments. Thank you very much, Paul. And as a, as a sort of expert in, in teaching and learning and pedagogy, what's your take, Nazira? Oh, absolutely agree with uh, both Nicola and Paul uh, on this. Um, students are, or oh, students are interested in in getting that graduate job, you know, in 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 their future. So that's what they're invested in. So I absolutely agree uh, with with Nicola and Paul on that. Thank you very much. Um, Johnny Rich is up next with a question again, which is really about value um, in relation to teaching and learning policy and outcomes. Johnny, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you, Alison, and thank you, everybody, for, for your presentations. I mean, it, my question isn't dissimilar to Quentin's, mm. but it's less pith pithily put. Um, but um, so I'll slightly reframe it as to what extent should we be looking at learning gain um, and revisiting the work done by Hefke and more recently by OFS. Thank you. Um, Nazira, would you like to start us off on this, please? Um, thank you. Then I'll go to Paul and I'll go to Nicola. Yeah, I think there is value in looking back at uh, uh, at learning gain. There was great uh, uh, investment in that and some great uh, uh, outcomes, some great models there. So. Um, I think it's how it, it integrates with or is embedded again with all our university processes, but does not create um, a, a whole industry in itself, but is taken into, um, into the, 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 the standard workings uh, of how we uh, support students, monitor their progress, uh, um, uh, and also, you know, look at the learner analytics at the same time and the learning uh, learning side of it. So uh, revisiting, I think, some of these things that we had invested in greatly pre previously is uh, is a valuable, uh, valuable thing to do. I'm Thanks. just not sure how uh, it fits in with some of our current uh, initiatives. Thank you. Paul? Um, some brief re reflections, because there's one question I would like you all to have a go at before we finish, so that would be helpful. I think notions of learning gain are really important because the context is different from learner to learner and even the, 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 the parts of society that different institutions um, serve. And, and indeed, I was on the initial um, TEF main panel, and indeed, you know, there are institutions that got, got TEF gold, whereby a lot of the things that they, they, they were doing in an absolute sense um, was, was um, 
not as important as what they were doing in a relative sense in terms of the value that they were adding for the students that they that they served and there is a learning gain argument i don't think that we as a sector can say we're about transforming lives and embracing widening participation without also embracing all aspects of the context in terms of the parts of society that we serve at, in, at an institutional level and indeed taking into the context of the individual learner so i actually think that learning gain is a tremendously important context that that that, that sh should continue to be inspected in, in in the way that i would have hoped that it would have continued to be inspected thank you very much paul and nicola you must have picked this up when you were at the ofs was it on your work yeah. this is a huge agenda and yeah. i mean obviously the ofs took on the work yeah. that hefke had started um and it's mighty complex and the idea there's going to be a simple a uh, single algorithm that identifies learning gain is just it's just not going to happen having said that i don't think the issue should be dropped i think john is right to be asking this question and what i would say is that the tef as revised has as a, 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 a as one of the um categories that it looks at educational gain which is a way of configuring learning gain so i think the tef submissions are going to be really rich and really important so i go back to that point about let's see what people are doing and see whether we can um, have another go at educational gain or learning gain because it's just so important it's what as as, as uh, nazira and paul said it's what universities do we've got yeah. to crack this understand it fantastic and in the last three minutes we are going to uh, ali Aiden, could you ask your question about the role of ed tech in teaching and learning. Thank you, Ali. Hi, everyone. Full disclosure, I'm not Ali. Uh, I'm Dan Clark. Uh, Ali's my manager. Um, oh, right. <laughs> she sent me the link because she wasn't able to make it the last minute. I thought I'd better say. Um, thank you very much for that. Such an insightful presentation. So in my field, which is digital learning, um, we're seeing an increase in ed tech companies and private education providers working very closely with HEIs and perhaps redefining what we mean by learning and teaching. Excuse the dog bark in the background and um how it should be delivered so do our panelists think that this is a threat or an opportunity or a little bit of both okay um let's go paul nazira then nicola thank you short answers please okay i think we could <laughs> we, we, we could appropriately deploy the concept of comparative advantage here and if a private company can deliver a service that, that universities would like to do at a higher quality or, or, or lower cost then it should be considered about the stuff that we would do i don't think that should be a challenge it should be liberating to allow our staff to do what they're best at and if private companies can do what they're best at and add value i'm all for it great answer thank you nazira yep uh I think it's an opportunity, but I think it's who's driving the agenda. And I think universities need to drive the agenda, not the suppliers and the creators. So um, we we need to take control of this. Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Nicola. I, I am in the camp of um, digital technology being um, a fantastic opportunity and one we've got to seize and make the most of. Most of. Um, I think it could be um, just utterly transformative in a positive way, providing it doesn't exclude the personal. So it's it's digital teaching and learning, supporting personal engagement with students. It's not either or. And if we can get that right, then I think it really can be massively positive. Thank you so much, Nicola. And um, listening to you talk and you're extolling us to uh draw richness from the TEF when it comes out in September uh, I'd just like to remind people that we do have the advanced HE teaching and learning conference 4th to 6th of June where all of this is really debated richly and good learning practices shared so mark that in your diaries um, if you're interested in it um we have got one minute to go what I'd like to do is thank our panel members hugely for the richness they've got into the session um so we can all give you a virtual clap and then I'd like to hand over to Nick just to say a closing word or two thank you very much panel you were fabulous <laughs> and, and a thank you to you Alison for chairing that so well I was jotting down all the questions I wanted to ask and I think every single topic uh, that I wanted to ask about and I had a long list came up so thank you to the panelists and thank you to you Alison and your colleagues and just to flag one other thing um, as Alison said at the start every year Advance HE and HEPI do the student academic experience survey which really gets under the skin of lots of these issues and we're launching the 2023 iteration of that in late June on the 22nd of June so do look out for that do make use of the data for earlier years for your own institutions um, and finally if I could just end as well by thanking my colleagues at HEPI including Emma who's 
um, being behind the scenes, making this uh, sure this event has uh, gone smoothly. Both Advance HE and Happy want to continue this conversation. So please, um, please help us uh, help us to do that and to engage with you. Many thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye, everybody.